Hey folks, Jamie here. Thank you for tuning in. Before we get started, I would like for you to take a moment and go down below and hit the like and subscribe buttons. Maybe leave a comment. If you're really feeling generous, maybe share this video to your social media feeds. What that does is make it a lot easier for other people to find a moment of Tiki. I really appreciate it and it helps out a lot. Thanks. Now, on with the show. Welcome to another episode of A Moment of Tiki coming to you from the Lagoon of Mystery, my home tiki bar here in Central Texas. Uh, today I am going to get up on a soapbox and hold forth on a topic that is near and dear to my heart and that I am quite opinionated about, and that is music for a tiki bar. Music is one of those elements that contributes mightily very, very, very mightily to the overall ambiance and immersion factor that is so important for a great tiki bar experience. And I'm not a purist. I have been open that I am a relative uh, newcomer to tiki, having only been involved since 2017. But music is one of those areas that you have to take very seriously that a lot of new uh, commercial bars don't always give the proper respect for. Um, I have a friend who is not into tiki like me, kind of uh, just now finding out about it and exploring it. And uh, the other week, uh, he and his wife went to San Antonio to a tiki bar uh, there and came back and reported on it. Now, I don't want to call anyone out so let's just say it rhymes with Hugman's Oasis. And he came back and I asked him how it was. And he goes, well, it was okay. The drinks were good, but uh, uh, he was kind of at a loss for words. And so I said, the music sucked? He goes, yeah, music really sucked. They were playing, you know, dance mix and all this other stuff that completely destroyed the ambiance, the vibe, the feeling of being transported away. And this is not a problem that is new to Hugman's. In fact, that was one of the biggest overall complaints at their uh, friends and family party, the preview party that they had before they actually opened. They were playing top 40, 80s music. And everyone in attendance said, now this is not appropriate because you're reminding people that they're not in a tropical hideaway. And time and again, management says, we've got the message. We understand loud and clear. And time again, people go to Hugman's and suddenly inappropriate music is being played that is jarring that you would find at a nightclub somewhere else. And one time I asked one of the bartenders about this and the bartender got very, very defensive right away and said, you cannot expect us to have to listen to Martin Denny over and over and over all night long. Nobody's asking that. Said, so you don't have to listen to Exotica. You can listen to Surf. You don't expect us to be able to listen to Surf over and over and over all night long. I said, well, no, you don't just have to listen to Exotica and Surf. You can listen to Bossa. You can't expect us to listen to Bossa Nova. Oh. At that time, I realized um, that the bartender's complaint was bullshit. No, no, I'm sorry. It's not bullshit. It's chicken shit because it's not just duplicitous, it's dishonest and cowardly. The bartenders only want to play what they want to listen to. They don't care that they're working in a tiki bar. They don't care that escapism is the prime selling point of a tiki bar. They don't take seriously the theme of the establishment they're working in. For example, if you were to work as a bartender at Cowboys Dance Hall to reference another popular San Antonio night spot um, that specializes in country and western music. When the management leaves, you would not put on Metallica or Me Megadeth because you can't expect us to listen to that shit kicker stuff all night, can you? No, if you're working in a New Orleans jazz club and there's no live acts performing, 
you you wouldn't put on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you're not going to stick on the Art of Noise, or or John Denver, or Barry Manilow. You're going to play the music that is appropriate for the genre of establishment that you're working in. So the fact that they refuse to play tiki appropriate music shows that they do not respect the genre the motif, the theme of the restaurant bar that they are currently working at. And that's a shame because music is one of the funnest and most immersive parts of the entire Tiki experience. So for you folks at home, uh, be you a home bartender uh, developing your own Tiki escape, or if you are a commercial developer looking to open a tiki bar. If you just want to have a bar to make money and don't care what the music is playing, then open a faux dive bar. One, it's a lot cheaper. You don't have to spend $50,000, $100,000 on decor. And you can play whatever the hell music you like. It doesn't matter because people are just going to come in there and pay for a shot and a beer. There you go. You don't have to make these frou-frou fancy exotic cocktails with all these bizarre ingredients like falernum that you can barely pronounce. No. Open a dive bar, sell a shot in the beer, rake in the money, and don't worry about it. But if you want to open a tiki bar, then I am going to give you a wide assortment of musical options that you can mix and match and combine to fit your personal aesthetic and I'm going to give you some guidance beyond that so you can go and seek out music that I don't even mention here and wrap it into your personal motif and knock the socks off of anyone who comes into your place looking for a bit of escapism and auditory removal from the cares of the modern world. No, I am going to start with the overall uh, biggest elephant in the room, and that is Exotica. Exotica is the de facto music of Tiki. It is an offshoot of jazz that is normally performed as instrumental based on a Latin shuffle, often featuring vibraphone and simulated bird and jungle sounds by the band members. That's the all, the, all this weird background noise that simulates a jungle environment. Um, the overall style is evocative of exotic destinations, although the style draws little from indigenous music styles. Some of the biggest names, I'm going to give you a rundown. This is by no means exhaustive. Les Baxter. Les Baxter was a composer, musician, band leader, uh, film score. He had a tremendously wide and varied career. Uh, he, he arranged for Nat King Cole, uh, did work with so, so many people. But he is relevant here because he is the man who invented Exotica. It was invented or it, it was unleashed upon the world in 1951. Uh, when Les Baxter released his album, Ritual of the Savage. Every single track on this album has become an Exotica classic covered by dozens, if not hundreds of other musicians, not just in the Exotica genre, but in classical and mainstream jazz and everything else. I mean, it was that influential. Baxter went on to record Tambu from 1955, um, African jazz and jungle jazz in 1959. Those are both my favorites. I really love the compositions on that. Um, and Sacred Idol in 1960, among others. Baxter did a lot more work than just this. He composed many albums and released many albums and did film scores for all the American international beach pictures and the horror movies and stuff. But his Exotica is just astonishing. Um, next up is Martin Denny, who gave the genre of Exotica its name when he released 
the album Exotica in 1957, which consisted mostly of covers of Les Baxter's songs from his previous albums. Now, Martin Denny, uh, if I'm not mistaken, had a quartet uh, and uh, stripped down the orchestrations. Les Baxter's arrangements were very lush. He used a full orchestra with uh, strings that kind of got a little syrupy, if you know what I mean, you know, the early 1950s. Uh, but the beats and the inspiration were very evocative. Martin Denny stripped these down to work with a four-piece or a five-piece combo, and his band working in the Shell Bar in Honolulu uh, was performing one night and frogs in the pond outside started croaking in time with the music. Afterwards, customers, patrons from the bar came up and said, we really, really like that frog song. Can y'all do it again? And Denny realized that they were onto something with the exotic animal sounds. So he and his band members started to add sounds throughout to punctuate and highlight the various tunes and that really caught fire. Uh, he followed up with uh, Forbidden Island, 1958, uh, Primitiva, 1958, The Enchanted Sea, 1960. Uh, he had dozens and dozens of albums all the way up through 1990. Was it that big of a deal? Uh, had a huge hit, huge hit with Quiet Village, which was originally composed by Les Baxter. Um, and Martin Denny is probably the single most influential performer of Exotica ever. Now, the second most influential would be Arthur Lyman, who played vibraphone for Martin Denny on that first album when they released Exotica. Uh, the, uh, the album was so big. Back then, normally everything was all released in mono, but stereo was becoming popular. Uh, between 1957 and 1958, Exotica, the album, plus Quiet Village, the hit single, were so popular that they went back into the studio to record an all-new, fully stereo version. Well, Arthur Lyman had split off to form his own band at that point. Such was the demand for Exotica. So he did not play vibraphone on the follow-up album, or, or the stereo version of that, which is an interesting bit of trivia. It's, two entirely different recordings of the same material. Arthur Lyman went on to record Taboo in 1958, Hawaiian Sunset 1958, Moana A 1958, The Lays of Jazz, which is kind of his landmark magnum opus. That came out in 1959, and he released literally dozens of albums of original compositions, covers, uh, all the way through 1980. Um, very, very influential man right there as well. Now, these are the old guard. These are the ones who established Exotica and made it the huge event genre that it is, but there are modern performers who have taken up the mantle. Don Kiki is a band that formed in Hawaii in 1997. In fact, they got Martin Denny to perform on a couple of tracks of their debut album, The Forbidden Sounds of Don Kiki. Not only that, Lopaka Colon, who is their percussionist, is the son of Augie Colon, who was percussionist for Martin Denny back in the day. And Augie Colon also had a number of albums under his own that went out and are highly sought after by collectors today. So they are carrying on the tradition, the legacy of the original Exotica Masters. Another really good band that you should check out from Hawaii is the Waitiki Seven. Um, they are very jazz influenced. You listen to the music and you cannot help but hear some of their influences. It's a very jazzy group. Uh, they got a quirky sense of humor. You hear it in their music, their song titles, their albums, but they are consummate professionals. They are extremely talented. And if you can seek them out on YouTube, by all means do so, because they're very, very good. Uh, another group that I absolutely have to recommend is Ixtawele. They're from Sweden, which is not a land of tiki bars and exotica, but this uh, group discovered exotica and have mastered it. They are like old school 
Exotica musicians brought forward into the modern era with all the updates and in instruments and recording technology. Their albums are a delight to listen to. They're just so much fun and full of energy and vitality. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. And finally, I need to reference, uh, mention Kava Khan. This is a departure from some of the others. Kava Khan has a very dark and moody sound to their interpretation of Exotica. Uh, it, it's almost uh, electronica music, not entirely, but they kind of push the envelope and it's really fun to mix that in with your playlist to get a different change of pace and and it really works for the dark key bar, mysterious and moody. So those are some recommendations for Exotica. There's many more out there, but that should give you a good starting point. Oh, uh, the theme music to A Moment of Kiki, Secret of Kiki Island by Ken McLeod. That is totally 100% Exotica. Now, the next music we're going to discuss is Hapa Haole. Um, it's the original Tiki Bar soundtrack. Hawaiian music experienced waves of popularity throughout uh, the 20th century. In 1915, right prior to World War I, it became huge. Uh, then again in the 1930s during the Depression, very, very popular. And again in the 1950s through the early 60s, coinciding with the run-up to Hawaiian statehood. Boom! Everyone was recording a Hawaiian album. Now, the music was generally known as Hapa Haole, which means half white. The reason it got this name is because artists would take traditional Hawaiian songs and put English lyrics on them and record them. Oftentimes, they would uh, be session musicians in Los Angeles recording in Hollywood studios, and they would put Hawaiian or Tahitian or Polynesian, vaguely sounding Polynesian names on the bands to pass as authentic, and they were anything but. Um, <clears throat> since then, it's kind of come full circle and Hapa haole has been embraced as an art form in and of itself, but you know, originally it was only had like one foot in the traditional uh, cultures of Hawaii. So I'm going to go over a couple of artists here that you will be able to look up and explore further. Uh, the first, and I, I can't, you can't discuss Hawaiian music without discussing Alfred Apaka. Uh, he was a superstar, phenomenally talented uh, man. In fact, yeah. I've got his album, the very best of Alfred Apaka right here hanging over up here in Laguna Mystery. I mean, the man is hugely, hugely influential. Uh, he's, he was the most famous Hawaiian singer of his era. He was a regular guest on the nationally syndicated Hawaii Calls radio show, which was heard all around the world. Stars like Frank Sinatra were fans and pushed him to sing more pop standards, but Apaka wanted to focus on Hawaiian music, and he did until his untimely death in 1960 from a massive heart attack. Um, albums of his include My Isle of Golden Dreams, which he recorded with the Andrews Sisters in 1952, uh, Broadway Wears a Lay in 1957, and South Seas Island Magic, 1957. Um, you saw, I have like the best of Alfred Apaka, it's a uh, greatest hits collection. The man had a fantastic voice. Definitely, definitely want to get that. And his bread and butter was taking and reclaiming a lot of those Hapa Haole songs. And as a Hawaiian native, he sang those and took ownership. And he's just really, really good and very, very proud of his heritage. Um, Hilo Hattie was a singer, an actress, and a comedian. Um, she was a regular guest on Hawaii Calls, much like Apaka, um, and had a recurring role in Hawaii Five-O, the original version of the series that ran through the 70s. Um, albums include At the Tapa Room and uh, At the Hawaiian Village. She mostly recorded live in Hawaii rather than going into the studio. Uh, she was a, a character and an ambassador for Hawaii for many, many decades. 
Um, Combo Mahalo uh, is not a vintage historical Papa Howie band. Uh, they're actually based in Austin. Uh, have been around since the early 2000s. They have one album, Flight of the Blue Manu, and I highly recommend it. It's a throwback to the old school kind of ukulele uh, trio combo sound. Uh, they're really passionate about it. Uh, they play a lot of live gigs around Central Texas, and they're just really, really great guys to uh, hang out with and listen to because they've been doing it a long time and they just really love the sound um beyond that oh my gosh there are many 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 other groups uh recorded hawaiian albums hapahali albums uh marty robbins the famous country singer who did a uh, white sport coat and a pink carnation and also probably most famous for el paso um he recorded two of them which are really pretty good um Almost all pop stars did, uh, all the crooners did, uh, a lot of country artists. It was just, Hawaii was so popular that everyone did, and there were a lot of groups that were just devoted to Hapa Howl. So you can go into almost any thrift store in America and flip through the used record collections and come up with, you know, one or two Hapa Howie albums anytime you go there. It was just that huge and that popular, that much of a legacy. Um, next, we're going to kind of dovetail into a subgenre of Hawaiian steel guitar. Now, almost all of the Hapa Howley albums are going to have a lap steel guitar performance on it. That is just the almost cliche sound of Hawaii. Uh, but the lap steel guitar itself is a uh, rare art. Um, it's very closely associated with uh, country music, but the style of Hawaiian lap steel guitar is slightly different. Uh, but one of the reasons why Ho uh, Hawaiian and country lap steel guitar is so closely associated with each other is Jerry Bird. Jerry Bird was the most famous and most successful uh, lap steel guitar performer throughout most of the 20th century. Um, he was from Ohio originally, grew interested in lap steel by hearing a traveling Hawaiian performer. Uh, then uh, he just devoted himself to the craft. His greatest success came in the country industry, uh, country music. Uh, he played in Nashville for many, many years on all the great famous uh, performers. He, you know, he played with Hank Williams. He was a member of the Grand Ole Opry. That's where he made his name, but his passion was always in Hawaii. And in 1970, he moved back to Hawaii and devoted the rest of his life to teaching Hawaiians lap steel guitar so the art didn't die out. He's got quite a few, you know, he released quite a few albums during his time. Most of them are out of print, but there are some uh, greatest hits compilations out there that you can track down. Um, and he lived until 2005. Uh, okay, now apologies if I butcher this. Another really outstanding lap steel guitar player is Saul Ho'opii. Saul Ho'opii. He is the most famous native Hawaiian lap steel guitar player. Um, he provided music for the animated short Betty Boop's Bamboo Isle um, in 1932. So he predates Jerry Bird by quite a bit. Um, he was the go-to lap steel guitar player uh, up until 1936, he left his musical career and uh, went into Christian ministry. And that's where he devoted most of his life. But his early, early recordings are still available. And today his music's mostly available through compilation CDs. So if you can find uh, Soul's work, um, it's really good addition to your Kiki Bar playlist. This is a good segue into my next genre of music, which is related but not directly tied to it, and that is music from the Hawaiian Renaissance. Um, the Hawaiian 
cultural renaissance flourished in the 1970s through the 1990s, uh, drawing on culture, identity, and tradition to distinguish itself from the tourism-based Hawaiian identity that was mostly defined by the Hapahali sound and the steel guitar sound uh, that was essentially a cliche presentation of Hawaiian culture. Um, the Hawaiian Renaissance inspired indigenous Hawaiians to record their own music that was distinct from those previous forms that represented uh, their culture and their islands. Um, my favorite is probably the Bro Brothers Casimero. Uh, apologies if I am mispronouncing that. Uh, their album, Hoala, is just fantastic. Uh, the, um, they've got a bunch of compilations out there, several best of uh, greatest hits, compilation CDs. They are tremendous vocalists with uh, wonderful harmonies. They put a lot of expression and passion and, and emotion into their songs. They have some of their original music that they've written and recorded. Uh, they've covered a lot of music that was written and performed by other artists of the Hawaiian Renaissance generation. They're just fantastic. And what's great about them is that most of their music is still available. It's still in print on CDs. I believe it's available for download or streaming digitally. Um, very talented, very talented, and I cannot recommend them highly enough. I like to mix their sound in with other music in my tiki bar. Um, another hugely influential group is the Makaha Sons and Meet Me How. This was a super group before super groups were. They won every Hawaiian music awards out there. Uh, they had album of the year, song of the year. They produced a string from a, a, of tremendous music from the late 70s through the 80s. They broke up and one of their members went on to score the biggest hit ever by Hawaiian. That is Israel. Here, here I'm going to butcher another name. Uh, Kamakawa Iwo Ole. Um, mostly he's known as Brother Is. Uh, he recorded, uh, legend has it, woke up inspired in the middle of the night, like at midnight, uh, called his producer, said we got to record the song, went to the studio and recorded his famous Somewhere Over the Rainbow in one take. Sat down, recorded it, played the ukulele, and one and done, and that became a massive worldwide hit. Um, unfortunately, you know, he has since passed away, but that's not all that he's done. He's released several albums, uh, Facing Future, um, I, uh, oh gosh, what's the name of that? The, the song, um, he, he's got, he's got a song about uh, Sumatori, uh, all the great Hawaiians who went to Japan in the 1990s and became massively successful sumo wrestlers. He's, it's just, the fact that these are Hawaiians looking at their culture from the inside and seeing the things that matter to them and then writing and singing about it is very, very different from what we'd gotten before from mainlanders going to Hawaii or not even going to Hawaii but just looking at Hawaii and writing what they think is meaningful to the population um, yeah it's that's Hawaiian Renaissance has some fantastic stuff and one more I definitely want to add because I've got several of his CDs uh, Kuana Torres Kahele he has an interesting project because he is recording songs for each of the Hawaiian islands, one album per island, where he is collecting songs 
from the local population that are distinct and original to those islands and recording those and releasing them. It's really fascinating uh, glimpses into the differences in the histories and the various divergences of the populations of the different islands from Kauai to Maui, Hawaii, the big island, and Oahu, and, and the various other islands that most tourists never go to. He's collecting all these folk songs and recording them and preserving them for posterity, and I, I think that's a magnificent, magnificent uh, endeavor. Now here's one more that dovetails into the Hawaiian Renaissance the same way lap steel guitar dovetailed into Papa Halley, and that is slack key guitar. Uh, during the Hawaiian Renaissance, uh, slack key guitar became, well, it was always popular among the Hawaiian populace, the, the natives, the indigenous Hawaiians, uh, but it became very visible to those outside that cultural reference point during the Hawaiian Renaissance. Uh, slack key is, was a locally developed style of guitar playing. It's, uh, I believe it's a finger pick style where the guitar is tuned to form a single chord, usually by slacking one or more of the keys. So it's tuned in a different way to make the strings a little looser so they play in a different key, forming a complete chord. Uh, it's a technically proficient style. Uh, it's relaxing. It's a mellow sounding acoustic, uh, normally unaccompanied by other instrumentation uh, from what I've heard. I'm, again, not an expert, but I've got a collection of it and it's distinct and it's hard to compare to anything else. I mean, you, it invites comparisons to jazz guitar, but it's got its own intent and purpose to it, so it's not generic. I mean, you hear slack key guitar, you recognize it instantly. It's, a, it's quite a distinct form. Um, Dancing Cat Records is the end all be all of slack key guitar music uh, source. Um, they have an extensive catalog of albums from an array of artists. They've been doing this for, gosh, like 30, 40 years. I think the only other Hawaiian album uh, record company with a track record like that uh, comparable is, is the Mountain Apple Company. Uh, so check out Dancing Cat Records. Uh, a lot of the stuff's out of print. A lot of it can be found used and they still put out new albums continuously. So uh, some of their artists that you'll want to check out that I have and find them quite excellent are Moses Kahumoku, uh, Cindy Combs, Ozzy Kotani, uh, there are many more. Ozzy Kotani uh, in particular has uh, an album out called Music for the Queen, I think, it's I'll put it right up there. It is composed entirely of slack key guitar instrumental performances of music that was composed by Hawaii's last sovereign queen. And it's beautiful, beautiful stuff. And with that, this has gone on a lot longer than I anticipated. I knew it was going to be a long episode, but I didn't quite realize how big of a soapbox I've been standing on. And I've just gone into three pages and I have a whole stack more. So this is the end of part one. Uh, come back for part two where I dive into the rest of these and give you more music that you can play in your dark tiki bar. Until next time, aloha.